Thank you, Senator Booker. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, congratulations to both of the nominees. Uh, Judge Jackson, you and I attended law school together. We uh, did, sir. Uh, it is good to see you. Good to see you again. Congratulations. Um, let me start with a general question to both of you, uh, which is how would you define judicial activism? I think judicial activism is when uh, a judge is unable or unwilling to separate out their own personal views uh, of a circumstance or a case and they rule consistent with those views rather than the law as they're required to do. I would give the same answer, Senator Cruz, and also add, although judicial activism means many things to many different people, uh, for me it also suggests a judge who goes outside uh, beyond the issues presented to the court. Uh, judges are limited, They're, they have quite a restrained role in that they are to only decide the issues presented to them, and one form of activism um, is going beyond that. So what should a principal judge do if the law requires one outcome and your own personal political policy views are to the contrary? How does a judge resolve that conflict? Oh, absolutely, the, the judge is duty bound to follow the law. The law is the binding principle uh, that guides a case and um, judges need to methodically separate out their personal views. When I rule in my cases, um, I look at the facts, the law, and the party's arguments in the same way in every case and I methodically apply only those inputs because I'm trying very hard not to look at this case through anything other than the prism of the binding precedents of the Supreme Court and the DC Circuit. And so absolutely there's no question that a judge has to set aside their personal views about how a case comes out and rule only consistent with the law. That's absolutely correct, Senator. Uh, the roles of advocate and judge are completely different, but in the same way as an advocate that I set aside my personal opinions about my clients and what they were accused of or what they were guilty of, I would also set aside, if confirmed, my personal views, my personal convictions, if any, uh, because the law is what guides and should guide judicial decision making. Um. What are both of your views on the notion of a living constitution and whether we have a living constitution? Senator, I have not had any cases that have required me to develop a view on um, constitutional interpretation of text in the way that the Supreme Court uh, has to do and has to have thought about the tools of interpretation. I am aware um, that the Supreme Court, uh, at least if, with respect to certain uh, provisions of the Constitution that it has already interpreted, uh, has looked at history and has focused on the original meaning of uh, the text, say in the, in the Second Amendment context, context in the Heller case. Um, I just have not had any opportunity to do that. Um, I have worked with those kinds of materials. When I was in um, private practice, I filed an amicus brief in which we uh, argued using English common law um, about whether or not um, the English courts would have accepted evidence that had been extracted by torture. So was this the amicus you did in, in the Boumediene case? This was. This uh, was. And, and was that pro bono representation? That was. And I represented 20 former federal judges who wanted to make that point. And, and, and what led you, look, with pro bono representation, that often reflects your own views. That's why frequently lawyers take it on. What, what led you to want to take that position? Well, I wasn't, in, I wasn't uh, working alone. I was at a big law firm, mm -hmm. and I was in their appellate division, and it was a client. Mm -hmm. It was an, a, a group of judges who I was assigned to work with as a part of that, my employment in the law firm. But did you agree with the, the position you were advocating? 
Um, I was focused on my client's interest. I was doing what advocates do. I didn't have a personal view really of the issue other than just to make sure that I was making the most convincing argument that I could make on behalf of my clients. So uh, let me go back to the original question, which is, do, do you believe we have a, a living constitution? I believe that the constitution is an enduring document. It is, uh, it has, the Supreme Court has said um, a fixed meaning that we're to look to the original uh, words in the constitution and interpret, uh, as lower court judges would interpret provisions the way in which the Supreme Court does, and they look at the text and look at the original meaning. And so if I ever had one of those cases, that is how I would uh, approach the task. Ms. Jackson Akumi. Senator, thank you for the question. I don't find these phrases particularly useful. Uh, as a lawyer, uh, a living constitution is very similar to me, uh, like judicial activism. It means so many different things to many different people. I do know the Supreme Court has not used those terms. Uh, I know that Chief Justice Marshall said that we have a constitution that was meant to endure for ages, which it has, and to be adapted to the various crises of human affairs. And I think that is what has happened with our constitution uh, over, over the years. And uh, beyond that, it's the supreme law of the land. And if confirmed, I would be bound by the Supreme Court's interpretations of the constitution. It would not be my job uh, uh, to, to make, make law. So if you could both tell me your view of the importance of the First Amendment, and, and in particular the protections of free speech uh, and religious liberty. Well, Senator, my, my view comports with um, the Supreme Court's view, because as a judge, I have to apply uh, the doctrines of the Supreme Court. And it is very clear from uh, the court's uh, recent rulings from um, the, the recent COVID cases, Trinity Lutheran, Masterpiece uh, Cake Shop, and various others that the court um, is looking into and is concerned about uh, restrictions on religious liberty as a First Amendment principle. Um, as well they should be because the First Amendment uh, includes religious freedom as a core uh, constitutional right. So my, my views comport with uh, what the Supreme Court um, has held about these things, and I would have to apply the Supreme Court's principles in any of my cases. Ms. Jackson Akimi. I agree, Senator Cruz. The First Amendment is, is fundamental. It's foundational. All of the freedoms protected therein, speech, press, uh, assembly, petitioning for redress, um, uh, and religion. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cruz. Uh, Senator Padilla. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before I begin my questions, I want to take a moment to remark on uh, the significance of this hearing. As uh, Chairman Durbin uh, reminded us and, and noted at the outset of this hearing, over the past four years, uh, the prior administration appointed 226 judges to the 